Well, this afternoon we will be presenting the first case with Dr. Miguel Valderrabano and Dr. Diego Rodriguez. Uh, so let me repeat, this is a 65-year-old male patient with paroxysmal non-valvular atrial fibrillation classified as just VAS C3 and has bled of three. The medical history of the patient includes uh, warfarin and uh, urinary tract bleeding while on warfarin, and this was in 2010. In January of 2016, the patient developed a stroke and required thrombolysis with minimal neurological sequela. And uh, in 2016, in the month of August, the patient experienced major bleeding due to severe ulcerative colitis that required a hospitalization. Uh, the patient has obstructive sleep apnea and uses CPAP. For this patient, the treatment when he was admitted was visoprolol, 1.25 milligrams twice a day, apixaban, 5 milligrams twice a day, mesalazine, 0.8 grams twice a day, propafenone, 300 milligrams per day, and atorvastatine, 40 milligrams a day. This is the atrial fibrillation of the patient. And in this first image I am showing you, you will see the morphology. Apparently, this is what we call the wind hat structure and you can see here the appendage these are the different measurements that were taken at different angles to clearly determine the ostium and the anchor area uh, for the device On the lower right picture, you can see the distance from the ostium of the appendage and the septum, approximately 51. Here we see on a different uh, view the diameter of the ostium, 18 to 15 millimeters, and here 25 to 17 millimeters. And the last uh, view so sh shows the appendage, which is not longitudinal. It's at 61 degrees with a depth of 13 millimeters. The patient was studied. The routine tests were done. The ECG shows no significant uh, alterations. and. This is another study with different views and angles with an ostium of approximately 17 millimeters, a distance to the end of the appendage of 23 millimeters and measured from the ridge at 20 millimeters. A line is drawn which goes perpendicular to the circumflex. And finally, here we have the angles recommended. How many of you are doing appendage closures? Almost half of the room. Well, basically, the standard view is not on a CT, but in order to determine the size of the device and to determine whether the, pa the patient is a good candidate or not, we use this view 
uh, the distance is measured at the level of the mitral annulus where we have the circumflex artery. This is the mouth of the appendage on this image. This image is not very important for decision making but for implanting the device. And the distance uh, in the back of the appendage to determine whether the device may fit. Uh, that will determine the depth of the device or the sizing of the device. There are different types of devices as we will discuss. But this is the most important view when deciding the type of device. This is the circumflex and something which in my opinion is different when measuring the device is that, of course, the measurement is in the back of the appendage, but you must visualize the device sitting in this way and the direct distance at 90 degrees because the device will be flat and the real depth of the device is in this direction, not in this other direction. When we deploy the device, if there is not enough space for deployment, you will have a shoulder in this area, and usually that results in leaks because not all the device will be coated with the necessary material to cover the appendage. This is the most important uh, projection. Initially, we did CT. I don't know whether this is the standard in your labs, but we simply make the decision based on a transesophageal ultrasound. You may continue now, Diego. Well, so let me go back to show the measurements. This is the circumflex 17 millimeters. Well, this is Watsman case. The measurements uh, in the other case are different because you will have to determine the landing zone. This is for Watsman because this is a, a Watchman because this is a Watchman case. You may continue, Diego. And finally, these are the measurements, 117 and 124. I am going to do intracardiac ultrasound that we will need for certain views. So this is the appendage. with different measurements, two cavities and different measurements. All these measurements will be re-measured during the procedure. So this is the diagnosis for this patient. The patient has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, a shot has of three, uh, high risk of bleeding, ulcerative colitis with high risk of severe bleeding, and the patient had a stroke without any sequela. Well, I think that part of what we will see today is also very interesting because we are going to guide the implant with intracardiac ultrasound. The standard has always been transesophageal ultrasound, but the case is very clear. This is a patient with contraindication for anticoagulation because of the high risk of bleeding and stroke, though the patient already had a stroke, and that could be a contraindication for the clinical trial, but today it makes sense because it's a stroke caused by atrial fibrillation. This is not necessarily the case, but it could be possible. I don't know whether you have any questions from the audience, any suggestions, everybody agrees with the indication. Any special comments from those of you that have experience with Watchmen? So let me now continue with you, Diego. Are you ready to start with your case? Eleven French for the intracardiac 
Echo and uh, sheath, a uh, lamps 90, uh, lamp 90 sheath for transeptal puncture. This is what we are doing right now. We are placing the sheath. We are going to ask for anticoagulation. Well, let me connect to the septum before we anticoagulate. I would like to see the septum and make sure that there are no problems. Could you show us some images for the room? Because we just have the presentation. Can you show us what you are doing? Uh, maybe you already have the intracardiac echo. No, no, Fermin. We are just completing the punctures. We are going to pass the intracardiac echo. I think that you can go to room three and see the case in room three, and then you can come back. You can come back to us later if you think, well, they are not too advanced either. We are waiting for the transducer, which is not available at this time in the room. Fermin, please move forward, and I'll let you know as soon as we are ready. We would like to show you the placement of the device, but I'll let you know when we are ready. Well, now that we are here, let me take advantage of this time before they are ready in the lab rooms. So let me talk to you about my perspective in this type of cases on the important role in electrophysiology of this approach for stroke prevention, of course. So let us know whenever you are ready. Well, basically, the rationale for closure of the appendage is, of course, to prevent thromboembolism. Because one of the most catastrophic consequences of uh, any disease is uh, disabilities. And uh, stroke, in my opinion, is one of the worse things that may happen in a patient with atrial fib. You have to be very clear as cardiologists and as physicians in general that the cornerstone to prevent a stroke is uh, warfarin. To be honest, a patient who is well controlled with warfarin and has never had any problems, that's the best you can do. Because all the trials nowadays have been done measuring head to head against warfarin. But what's the problem of warfarin? This is a slide that has been shown many times. But what's important is this balance between the very narrow therapeutic window if you are below the therapeutic window, there is a risk of ischemic stroke. And as the INR increases, the therapeutic window favors uh, hemorrhagic events. And this is the problem with warfarin. If warfarin was over here, that would be no problem whatsoever. And obviously, in our clinical practice, I believe that this is a very important point to understand. Patients at higher risk are the patients we are treating less, and those are the patients at higher risk of bleeding with anticoagulation uh, meds, particularly warfarin, particularly patients older than 70 years of age. And as age progresses, there is an increased risk of stroke. There is uh, 
less use of the drug because of the fear of bleeding and the risk of falls. And here, in my opinion, is where we have the largest number of patients not receiving proper therapy. Of course, nowadays, uh, the problem of warfarine has improved with the new anticoagulation uh, drugs. But the only problem with the new anticoagulation drugs is that uh, they are still uh, treatment where the patient has to take the drug. And compliance and cost continues to be an important factor around the world, even in the United States. And in the predisposed patient, because of an anatomic abnormality, advanced age, there is still a risk of bleeding. Uh, less with the new drugs as compared to warfarin, but it's uh, still a problem. So partially with the new drugs, we suggest that there is a, a better therapeutic range than with warfarin, but it is not necessarily the complete solution to the problem. The rational for closing the appendage uh, is the result of trials uh, uh, on a surgery where surgeons found that uh, there was a thrombus in the left uh, appendage. And the result is that probably in patients with non-rheumatic disease, because in patients with rheumatic disease, thrombi may develop in other parts of the atrium, which are not the appendage, and probably a high percentage of thrombi causing um, strokes uh, come from the appendage. That's why uh, the uh, explanation would be to close the appendage. There is a slide which I can't find, but I would like to show it to you, so let me close this presentation for one second. It's an old slide, probably. That's why it's not here. This is an image published during transesophageal echo. This is a patient with stroke, and you take an echo at this point, and you say there is nothing on the left appendage. This case is published in the literature in circulation. Uh, let me show it to you from the beginning. Basically, this is a patient undergoing transesophageal echo. Uh, thrombus is identified in the left uh, appendage, and the thrombus vanishes. And this is the story. I mean, you can see it here. This is the thrombus. And suddenly, it disappears. If you do the TEE to this patient, you don't see anything in the left appendage. But if you do the TEE at this moment, you would see a thrombus. So many times you have a patient with, uh, an, with stroke and you don't find the thrombus because it's already in the brain. And this image is very important because it shows that nothing is perfect. The thrombus simply migrated. And this is a TEE -E just at the time the thrombus is running away. I think that this is a very important concept. It clearly explains the rationale for our approach. Regarding the anatomy, the left appendage is a remnant, an embryological remnant of the right atrium. And it is totally different from the right atrium. The uh, left appendage has a neck and a saccular aspect. different from the right appendage, which is basically the lateral wall of the right atrium. And this is important because we have to understand how strokes develop. And this is basically the anatomy. There are a lot of interdigitations inside the appendage with different anatomies. And that's why different names have been given to it, including chicken wings. <laughs> this is an angle, which is oval, uh, elongated, 
and the anatomy of the appendage predisposes to the development of thrombi. The most important factor is blood inside the right appendage. And the image of uh, this uh, appendage, which uh, can be seen in the ultrasound, suggesting the presence of thrombus. Devices and procedures have changed as time has gone by. This was the first procedure ever done. And basically, the basic concept behind this procedure is based on what is specified here. Any device you place, it's not just for the closure. It's because of the epithelization and the endothelium that will grow on top of the device, which will finally seal the uh, left, uh, the passage of the left atrium to the left appendage. And that's why aspirin and Plavix uh, are administered for a certain period of time with regards to the implant, for instance, for watchmen, the measurements are the ones we already mentioned. You have to take the measures, the measurements here. This is the histological image. And the idea is that there has to be enough device cover of the endothelium so that when the endothelium grows, the endothelium will be healthy and the patient will have no leaks and no uh, communication or shunt because in the end, this thrombosis and what protects this is the device and the endothelium. And of course, all the inflammatory characteristics of the patient also have an impact in order to prevent clot formation on top of the device, which is another option, of course. I think that this gives you an idea of what the device is all about and what is being done in terms of implants. Mm, I won't go into the details. Another option to close the appendage is the areate, which basically is uh, epicardial with lasso around the appendage and thrombose from the epicardium. There is no clinical trial for this device yet, to be honest. I don't know whether any of you have been involved in this type of trials, but that, those are the other options. So we have three options. Watsman amulet that we will see today as well. This is a rather different device. This is a drawing of amulet. I don't know whether the video is working properly. This is a different device. It's different from Watchman. Watchman is... Uh, a device closure, and this is the epithelial uh, closure, and the area uh, shape is different. It has two components, and uh, this is inside the appendage. And the third option would be, as I mentioned before, the lariat. The lariat. These are the three options available, actually, for closure of the appendage. So let's go to the room. No, 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 todavía no, todavía no. Eh, eh, vamos a medir presiones, ¿verdad? We're going to be measuring pressures, right? Can we see the eyes in just one large screen? Eyes. Fermin, can you hear me? What I'm going to do is a puncture to show. We haven't done anything under fluoroscopy. We have just visualized uh, the appendage. Can we show the one that we recorded previously? We have measured the size of the appendage in an angle from the right ventricular outflow tract. This is what we have measured before. This is a diameter of 1.1 centimeters. Obviously, it's not the only one that we're going to measure. But just a second, Miguel, will you leave this image? I'm going to explain. 
The echo is on the right ventricle. We acquire the image of the right ventricle. This is the first uh, structure in front of the catheter, which is uh, the septum of the right ventricular outflow tract. Uh, this is the aorta. No, no, give us a previous image, please. This would be the right cusp, uh, the left cusp. Uh, this is the left atrium, the anterior wall, the posterior wall. In here you see this. This is the esophagus. Uh, the esophagus is coming down here. This is upon the left upper left pulmonary vein, the ridge of the left upper pulmonary vein with the entry of the appendage. So this is one of the images used to see the appendage. It uh, doesn't necessarily work always, but it's a good image to have a good idea of the larger axis uh, of the entrance uh, of the appendage or the mouth of the appendage. Okay. Let's look the eyes, intracardiac echo. Uh, let me show you how we use the transeptal puncture without a, a fluoroscopy. Fermin, just a minute, it's worth to highlight that uh, the probe of the echo is very close to the superior vena cava where we saw the guide wire go through, the guide that we used to do the puncture. And then we injected uh, some saline solution that you see there. It comes from the superior vena cava. It means that the tip of the sheath is above. And very importantly, so far we have used uh, zero fluoroscopy. So this would be the thicker portion of the septum and the upper portion of the foramen of a foramen of Ali. And an important thing, Diego, do clock and counter clock so that you can show the dimension from the aorta to which is the lower right pulmonary vein and the place where you're going to be doing the puncture. So bring it more anterior, give it counter. This would be a very anterior puncture. Make it more anterior, Diego. The echo. The coronary sinus, the posterior portion of the posterior recess of the left ventricle, this would be very anterior for a puncture. Please give it clock. This is uh, ideal. This is perhaps the right appendage. Uh, this would be the septum on top. Nobody's going to want to make the puncture through here, but through the thinner portion. More clock, please. This is uh, the lower right uh, pulmonary vein, and this would be too posterior. So we're going to select uh, the thinner area between the most posterior and the most anterior area for the transeptal puncture, and this would be this area here. And uh, keep that angle in ice, and I'm going... This is the sheath. You can see it coming down. Yes, we're pulling the sheath there. I need uh, some clock, clockwise there. The needle is underneath the, the thicker part. Let me let me describe something. In any patient where you're going to do transeptal puncture, this is very important because it made me miss the people don't see it and they believe that strokes come from another origin. We always see here in this area and there can't be a thrombus here, no thrombus here. And you may imagine what would happen if you push a thrombus. And this is a very important view because we have seen that although the patient is anticoagulated and this patient is anticoagulated, sometimes thrombi form at the tip of the sheath and you bring them from the femoral. And if you recognize a thrombus here, you simply remove everything, you clean the system, and then you pass it again. And this is another good use of ice before you make the puncture. You can assess the sheath and the needle before you pass into the left atrium. That's very important. And uh, here we have anticoagulation with a goal uh, above uh, 250. We are at 250, 300. And the sheath that we are going to use is, uh, is a lamp knife with a BRK1 needle. And one thing. The puncture for the watchman, it, should you go trying to go posterior or anterior? You have an ability to choose, yes. But for the watchman, you always recommend it lower and more posterior than usual. 
We have given anticoagulation. I think that I'm going to puncture. I'm going to pass my needle. My needle. These needles look like mine. They don't perforate. Uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble. It doesn't want to go through. Go back a little bit. Lower. Okay. Suction there. I'm going to apply suction. And we are going uh, to purge. And j just a minute. Just a minute. Don't push, don't push. Don't push. Show me the tip of this catheter. I saw a clot there. I saw a clot. I swear, I swear. Before you push. Put it in real time, Luis. Real time and show me the tip. We already crossed. Yes, you have the needle, but you don't have the sheath. Okay, Fermin, you can see the tip. I don't see a clot. Okay. Yeah, it may be a little bit uh, unsharp. The needle is covered by the dilator. I don't want to lose it. We are trying to work counterclockwise. It appears that the septum had been per, uh, perforated previously. The puncture, yeah, yeah, it's it's putting up a fight. No, no, no. Yeah, we have passed, yes. Well, one of the options when you pass a dilator, Diego, can you describe it? It would be to place the guide wire in the upper right pulmonary vein. Yes, yes, I sometimes make a clockwise rotation of the dilator so that I simply take towards the right superior, the right upper one. But just give me the guy, the, the Amplex uh, guide wire. The Amplex uh, guide wire, please. We are going to use a super stiff Amplex guide wire. I think I'm there. I'm right there. I'm right there. Yes, the sheath uh, advanced. Um, yeah, it required a little bit more of faith, and we've uh, done it. We are now transeptal. We are going to measure pressures in the left atrium. No, we have decided not to. We are going to use the super stiff Amplax guide wire. I'm advancing it, and you can see we haven't applied the fluoroscopy yet, but I think that we have no option at this point but to use fluoro. I'm going to go back to the previous angle, Fermin. This is what I taught uh, this morning. You can cross to the right ventricle, and now Yes, you can see the right cusp, the left cusp, non-coronary, atrial, atrium, atrial appendage. Uh, you see there my uh, the Amplex guide wire? Do you see the J-tip? Yes. Yeah, we see the pigtail there. Engaging uh, the left upper pulmonary vein. So I retract. And we leave the amplax in the left upper pulmonary vein, and we haven't used any fluoro yet. But now we're going to have to use fluoro because we're going to have to pass the watchman um, sheath to dilate uh, the septum, and it is uh, 12 French sheath that we're going to use. Are we all protected with our lead aprons? Yes. 
Okay. I'm going to orient. No, there are no x-rays. <laughs> so as you can see, the vein, the guide wire is in the left upper pulmonary vein. And you can see here the anterior descending artery and the left coronary artery. You can see them per perfectly well. This is the left coronary, the main trunk of the left coronary, which is uh, directly underneath the left atrial appendage, and that's how you orient yourself. So you know it goes through here. So left cusp, right cusp, non-coronarian, uh, the appendage, and uh, the uh, right upper pulmonary vein. So if you're doing ablation of ventricular extrasystoles, uh, this would not be the right position. Here you are under, th under the left coronary, and this is the view, exactly the same view that is used to measure this. I'm making an image later on. If you want to determine if there are thrombus, uh, there is thrombus in the appendage apex, you cannot get it through this view because you don't see the appendage apex. Uh, what is uh, this is? how you think it is a pulmonary artery. The art pulmonary artery is over here, so usually we place the echo on the pulmonary artery, and then you have direct viewing of the apex of the left atrial appendage. And here you can't see the apex completely, so you cannot say that there is no thrombus. You have to have the view from the pulmonary. In this patient, we did a TEE, and we know there is no thrombus. Here we're trying to dilate. Okay, so we, we are going to how we had it previously. Okay, the 14 French uh, uh, sheath is what we are going to use, the watchman sheath is what we are going to use to dilate the septum. I'm passing. I'm going through the septum with a dilator. Can we get fluoroscopy, please? We went through, so now? Now this is when the variation begins as compared with the procedure using TEE. As you can see now, the sheath is crossing the septum. It's perfect. We have dilated up to 14 French, and we're going to remove it, leaving. Try to move the camera because it looks very dark. The fluoroscopic image is very dark, and we can't see what you're doing. Move the camera up or, up or down, or use lung filters uh, to see if you can improve uh, the image for us. I'm trying to go the intracardiac, go through the septum, and then uh, that looks so much better. In the, in the Give me the left atrium, please. I'm trying to get the eyes to go through the septum. And this uh, might be somewhat difficult. Uh, um, you have to be patient because it is the most uh, challenging part uh, uh, of doing this procedure with eyes guideline, guidance. Could you move the eyes, the echo over there, please? As I said, we have dilated the transeptal puncture up to 14 French, and with that, you could think that the echo, which is 10, uh, should go through. But it, I'm having a little bit of trouble getting it through. The dilator passes through. In live cases, it always takes longer than in regular cases. 
the angle the image uh, showed uh, showed by the eyes shows us as we go through if we only see the wire crossing it's uh, because we are not exactly where we should be you're through you're through did you see that fermin yeah left atrium okay obviously the image of the left atrium is much better because the septum is not there. You are seeing an image directly in the left atrium. So we see the appendage. We are going to measure again. Could you stop it, Luis? Okay. Measure, please. From, okay. I don't know how you did it previously. You Go up, 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 uh, to the left, 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 left. Right there, right there. Straight up. Straight up, straight up. Up, 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 up. To the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. And here we get 1.7. Okay. Le I think that I'm in the pulmonary vein. Give me the life image, please. So I'm in the pulmonary vein, the left upper pulmonary vein. What you can you do is rotate clockwise and counterclockwise to scan the entire appendage. And we are going to measure the broader portion, which I think is over here. Measure again. One, let we see some of the circumflex right here, right? Measure there again. Remember that the TEE to measure the size uh, the, is a circumflex. And up, 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 up. And to the right. 1.7 again, depth. Because uh, we want our girl from Boston to be at ease with this. Uh, and I'm going to try to go into the left lower pulmonary vein. Depth, we have enough, enough. There's a lot of depth there. I'm going to try to go there. Miguel, you need to clarify that because the device is not going towards the apex, but 90 degrees uh, to that line there. I'm going to see if I can rotate this to see the appendage. This is a different angle, yes, the vein and the artery, yes, wonderful. Another measurement, we can make another measurement right here. When you see the largest one, okay, right there. More to the right, I would say there, and now down, 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 down to the left. It's a small appendage. I'm going to make another measurement from the body of the left atrium. Uh, we've done from the left to the lower pulmonary vein, the left upper pulmonary vein, and here I'm, I'm looking straight into it. It's a very small appendage. 1.7 is the biggest measurement, and it is consistent with what we have measured. Miguel, I think this is very important. It's the first time that I see echo uh, uh, here. Measure the, the transesophageal echo has to measure and has to go through the esophagus, the posterior wall in order to get here. And here you have a, an image of the same quality of the TEE, but it's done directly in the left atrial appendage. And the image, of course, is so much better. It is better, and we haven't yet played with the frequency of the echo. But from here, you can select higher frequencies than is usual in the transducer, and it looks even better. Yes, it's a measurement of 1.7. So I'm going to re-advance uh, the 14 French uh, um, sheath. The puncture. OK, here we are. And now the pigtail. Tengo el, tengo el... Esto yo creo que ya está. Aquí está mal. 
Mm. This is contaminated. The wire is contaminated, so we are going to take it off. And we are going to pass the pigtail now. All these echo measurements uh, have to be confirmed with angiography later because uh, we know more or less the size. Because what matters is the angiography. This is a combined procedure of echo and angiography, and they are very interdependent. Uh, right oblique, please. The echo is at the pulmonary, right? No, I think I'm rather in the body of the left atrial appendage. This would be the pulmonary and this would be the ridge, exactly, yes. But I'm not yet. This is the left ventricular outflow tract, the anterior mitral valve, the mitral aortic continuity, the circumflex artery, and perhaps the cardiac vein. We need purging with saline, please. One of the things that we can do when we think about isolating the appendage, look at how close it is to the circumflex. When I see this image, I start to think about many different things that we do. And we are always worried about the distance, uh, in the, in, about the closeness that we have here. And there's also a flutter there. I'm going now to uh, pass the pigtail. It's advancing, and it should come out directly out here, right? Crossing the ventricle, crossing the ventricle. Can you see it there? A little bit more posterior, more clockwise. If you cannot rotate the, pig, like, the pigtail, it is It's in the ventricle again, yes. Here I'm in the appendage. No, I'm in the pulmonary vein, left pulmonary vein. Uh, it's going to be narrow there. Uh, I can see it very well in the eyes, in the echo. And again in the vein. We are going to need uh, contrast. Diego, could you magnify the view uh, in uh, the fluoro, please, a magnification? Let's see. OK, we're going to need contrast. Can you see better, Fermin? Yes, much better. I'm going to adjust the intracardiac echo to um, <laughs> No, the sheath is pointing me posteriorly. In the eyes, I'm seeing the pulmonary vein. The procedure is more angiography guided. You need more contrast because uh, this is a very large uh, uh, Sheath. One of the problems with the very few studies with the watchman was in incidence uh, of uh, brain embolism during the procedure, uh, unacceptable rates of them. Um, okay, we need much more contrast because of problems uh, of air embolism. So strokes associated with the procedure because of air embolism, because of uh, lack of care in the purging of the sheaths. And here with contrast injection, you can see the anatomy of the appendage. It's beautiful. We are going to try to cannulate the superior part with that superior lobe. We hadn't vi visualized it in any other view of that uh, superior lobe. I'm going to try to place the pigtail in the superior lobe. I'm going to place the p 
pig, uh, the pigtail up here, doing a counterclockwise rotation. So, we have decided that there were 17 millimeters, that was the largest diameter. I think that the appendage is larger than that. Give me the uh, right oblique caudal, the entry of the appendage in fluoroscopy. How large is it? What's the dimension under fluoroscopy? With the caudal view, we are going to separate the superior lobe from the inferior lobe, and we are going to see it clearly. S center it, center it. We don't want to see the stomach. What happened? We don't want subtraction there, please. OK, OK. I'm going to inject contrast. We separated the superior lobe from the inferior lobe. We cannot see the image very well here. Can you make it clearer? Can we lower the contrast? No, no, it's not helping. Can you see that I am in the upper lobe? How much contrast did you inject, Miguel? Eight centimeters, eight cubic, eight cc's. I'm injecting through the sheath, and this is important, not through the pigtail, because the images are much better when you inject through the sheath. Yes, I had never seen such good images injecting through the pigtail. So you're not injecting through the pigtail, you're injecting through the sheath. So the sheath is where, at the first mark? Inside the appendage, right? Yes, that's right. What we're going to do now, I'm going to advance further. Please center it. You're injecting through the sheath and not through the pigtail. So the pigtail in reality is just a protective system to make sure that the sheath will not perforate the left atrial appendage. When you make injections through the pigtail, I, 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 it's very frustrating for me because I can't see anything. And the images that you see now are very clear. Yes, they're very good. Another image here, another view. Uh, the view is better, much better like this. Here you can see it much better. I have uh, mixed with contrast and saline, but uh, the appendage, even if we have measured the 17 millimeters, uh, I, this appendage has a narrow neck, but then it opens into two lobes, the upper and the lobe. We have cannulated the upper one, and the division appears to be very proximal. So we are going to want to place the watchman in such a way that it uh, spans the two lobes between the neck and the division of the two lobes in order to close this appendage. The measurement, in fact, would be 18, 17 millimeters, 18 at the entrance, but the depth wouldn't be as, as great. There is a, a size of the ostium that we haven't been able to see with the eyes, but which we can see on angiography, the depth that right now. The, we have the three rings, the three marks on the sheath, and they mark. They mark up to 37 millimeters, right? So what we're going to place, the second marking, which would be here, but we can't see it very well. The second marking, which is at the 27 millimeter point, is more or less in the ostium. Can you give it uh, to us live? Because we have a repetition of the image and we cannot see the markings. Can you inject? Uh, saline to remove uh, the contrast in the sheath. Okay, give me some saline, please. This is important. This is the description of the markers on the sheath to determine the size of the device. This is what Miguel is trying to explain, but we can't see them because of the contrast. So you are placing the sheath on the upper lobe. Yes, and we can now see it better. Let's take another image here. We can see one, two, three markers. Can you explain the four markers based uh, on what you are going to use? Well, 
Although the ultrasound had told us 17 and the book says 24 is enough, no, let us show the live image. The live image is very clear. This is uh, still the flat right oblique. This is the overlapping of the two lobes. Show me just the last one. 27, I think that's the consensus. Miguel, could you ask them to show us the other image? This one is the repetition in live fluoroscopy. Well, I am going to record it live. Yes, we can see it now live. Let me put a bit more of a contrast. And we are going to record live. We will need the saline. line. I don't have it yet ready. Otherwise, we won't be able to place the watchman. Yeah. I am going to inject contrast without the video. This is just to show you where is the ox. Well, it's in the second annulus. I don't know whether we can record this. Could you show us an image with ultrasound? An echo image at this step, do you think that's important or not necessarily? No, I don't think it's necessary or important at this time. I have to maintain the uh, relationship of the sheath continuously, so I can't, I must keep these uh, tight. Here we can see the markers, yes. We can't see number one, we just see two, three, and four. Well, the middle one of the three proximals, the second one is where I want to place the watchman. I have chosen a 27, and this is where I'm going to place the watchman, maybe deeper. What size of watchman have you chosen? 27. We have not prepared the saw line yet, which is one important step. We are going to do it right away. One thing that we do sometimes when we place the watchman under general anesthesia is apnea because with the respiratory movements, if we are very deep, the respiratory movement can be enough for the sheath to perforate. But not yet, we still have the pigtail. Another important aspect you should mention, I don't know what's your practice, but the size of the appendage, of course, varies with volume. This is a patient that probably hasn't eaten or drunk anything for over 18 hours and is dehydrated. In our practice, before we start the procedure, we administer 500 to 700 cc of saline solution for the appendage to expand. One of the reasons why you see leaks later is because you undersize the device because the patient is dehydrated. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's very important. We measure the pressure at the beginning. If it's less than 10, we take corrective measures. Another important fact is that the appendage is extendable. You can measure seven millimeters of diameter. And if you place a watchman which compresses, maybe it's a 21, after placing the watchman, you measure the watchman and it measures 20 instead of 17. It has extended. The ostium expands. So I always try to use two size larger. 17, the next one would be 21. So if I can place a 24, that's better. And if I can fit a 25, even better. The anatomy of this appendage is quite complex and I believe the 27 is gonna be fine. But the idea is that the ostium of the appendage is modulated not just because of dehydration, but because it's extendable. So these are the two parameters that can change the diameter of the appendage so that the watchman will, in the end, be too small. Here we can see in the eyes the three markers, and the second one is more or less in the ideal location. Probably there is over-compression. 
but nothing happens if you have a watchman which is too compressed uh, unless it is exaggerated, which may give us little extension of the material of the watchman, but I have had compressions of 30% with no problem. It's a watchman that will remain stable. Do we have any questions from the audience at this point? Yeah, we have a question from Alberto. Well, we are always told to use a larger size for the device uh, after measuring the size of the implant. Why are you choosing two sizes larger, seven millimeters more than the ostium? Well, first of all, because I don't think that the measurements I have taken with uh, um, ultrasound are accurate. When studying the anatomy, are we flushing? Yes. When we study the anatomy, it, with contrast, we see that there are two lobes, and probably I have not visualized the upper lobe in the echocardiographic angles. And as I said before, the ostium is extendable. So a measurement of 17, when you place the watchman, you can stretch it up to 20. So probably if I had placed a 21 watchman with an ostium of 17, when measuring the watchman, the ostium will measure 20 because the watchman dilates or stretches the tissue. And uh, so if you can fit a larger one, it's better. So why don't you use 30 or 33? No, because that would be exaggerated. Well, I would have to explain this with a drawing, with a schematic drawing. When you place such a large one, the uh, rays of the watchman don't open properly, so there are wrinkles. That's important because in our learning curve, always the mistake was undersizing, not oversizing. And we always had to use a larger device than what initially we thought was necessary. And when we opened more than two devices, we always ended up with the largest one, not with the smallest one. I don't know whether you had the same experience when you began. Well, we began with the clinical trial and we had to follow the instructions by the book. But after the approval, we adopted the same attitude. You realize that many times you are undersizing grossly and it's not really worthwhile. Well, let me remove the pigtail. I don't have any more distal protection, so I will have apnea. Yes, when removing the pigtail, you must be very careful that the sheath does not move forward because if it moves forward, it will be pointing upwards and there will be a risk of perforation. Well, I have removed the pigtail. I have blood coming out. Well, in order for the wire guide to have this curve, it is under constant clockwise tension. Yes, this is very important. If he takes out his left hand, he will lose the curve and the position. So this hand must be locked on the uh, limb of the patient at the right angle. Yes, you can see it with the watchman. You can see how I am advancing. I want to, I would like to inject the contrast at this point. So we see how it is advancing under the ultrasound and in the fluoroscopy. I am going to use a bit of contrast here. And we are going to inject contrast. This should be like this. Contrast, well, maybe we are too deep. Yes, it's too deep. Let's uh, back up a bit, and I am going to advance the watchman to the right location. Here we are aligning the uh, rings or the annulus. Here you can see the tip of the watchman, and you can see simultaneously when it opens. Here I am removing the sheath. The watchman opens up. And now we can breathe. 
And now we need more contrast. We are going to assess, I think it's too deep, according to my first analysis, my preliminary analysis. Uh, we, but well, we are breathing now. Contrast, I am going to inject contrast now and see the result. First, I'm going to place the sheath and to put the echo here. It's, it's very pretty, it looks wonderful. The right oblique, please. And now I'm going to inject contrast. I'm going to coddle. This is, uh, <clears throat> well, I need a bit more of contrast. I don't like this over here. Don't you think that the pulmonary vein to the ridge has not been covered? Well, we can see it clearly when we inject contrast. I am not covering properly the lower lobe. So I need more contrast over here. I don't clearly see that the lower lobe is well covered. Let me analyze it properly. Well, this area in the upper segment corresponds to this area in the ultrasound. I think it's too deep. Yes, I think it's too deep. So let me take a look at it again. Now we are going to see the oblique, the caudal AP. In the caudal AP, we can see the separation of the upper and lower lobe. In this contrast injection, Fermin, we can see that the distal aspect of the watchman is involved with the upper lobe, and this doesn't allow for proper expansion. And it's, I am not sure that it is properly covering the lower lobe, but you also have a gap in the upper segment of the ridge. It creates like an accessory appendix. Well, let's see it. Uh, in detail, so let's see the caudal AP view. In the caudal AP view, if we look at the lower aspect of Watsman, the posterior lobe is well covered. Yes, it's perfect with regards to the ridge of the circumflex. There is no gap whatsoever there. The only decision we have to make is whether we want to cover these crevices in the most uh, superior aspect of the watchman. And that's a decision which in my opinion, well, maybe I can pull back one to two millimeters, but not much more. And if you try to do a pull and you just uh, go down and cover, well, let's do a test. As you can see, yeah, this is a tuck test, which is to pull the watchman. And when you do a good test, the shoulder area drops and will cover this area. Well, the lower shoulder covers enough the posterior lobe. I am rather worried by the fact, well, let me inject first. Yes, the question is, you move backwards, but in order to cover more the superior, maybe you end up with a shoulder in the lower one. Well, I don't have much margin to improve. In the lower segment, I don't have much margin. Maybe we would have to evaluate. It's, let's see the Doppler. But, well, I don't have much margin in the lower segment. No, the margin is very limited. 
And I think that sometimes you have to assume that not all lobes will be covered, particularly those which are next to the ridge. So I prefer not to do anything here. I have the feeling that I can lose the engagement in the lower aspect. But I am open for discussion, of course. Well, this is beautiful. If we all agree, we are going to take some compression measurements. Probably it's overcompressed, but not so much as we expected. So since we measured before, the maximum diameter was 17. Let us see how much is it now. And I bet you that it's going to be more than 17 as a proof of the fact that the ostium is distensible. Right now, we have distended the ostium of the appendage. So you are taking away a couple of millimeters on each side, but I promise you this should be at least 19. And the question is that we are pretty well compressed, probably over compressed. But the idea is that the ostium is distensible. What's the problem of uh, placing a too compressed uh, watchman? I can show it uh, in a drawing. If the watchman is not fully open, the material will be wrinkled and will not extend properly. 29, that's what I said initially. Well, we have distended the appendage a bit more. So let's do contrast injection in the flat right oblique without caudal or anything. I think that one important message during this uh, implant, Miguel, is that there, there is no hurry in releasing the watchman. Once you release the watchman, that's the final step. There's nothing else you can do. And that's why it's important to be extremely careful with measurements and measure in different angles. Look at the color, the absence of color. If you want to administer an additional injection, do it. But let's try to get it as perfect as possible because as soon as you release the whole uh, structure, there is no way back. Well, we are leaving here some proximal lobes that I dislike. No, I don't like those proximal lobes. I think that I can move backwards. Not, well, it's okay to follow the Boston consensus. They know much more than we do. And uh, I have the feeling, no, they don't see patients at six months. Okay, I can come more proximal. I. Well, I wouldn't like to leave this space. The reason why Miguel is thinking about this is that is because once he retracts the device, if he dislikes it, theoretically, I don't know how is your practice, but based on implants and on implant laws, you could never be able to use the same device. You can retract and pull, but you cannot retract and pull and deliver it back. So if you deploy it and you don't like it, you will have to remove the device and place a second one because you cannot push the same device back again. That's why he is thinking it thoroughly. Well, I, I have mixed feelings. I don't want to leave this uh, proximal area uncovered. So let's ask, who would like to leave this sack over here uncovered? Nobody. Nobody wants to leave it uh, uncovered. Zero votes. A hundred percent of them think that that sack doesn't play any role here and we have to do something about it. If you care to listen to our humble opinion. Well, the first thing I see is first question. The risk of retraction. Can you retract it? What's the risk? Am I going to lose the engagement of the lower lobe? Yeah, probably. Let's see the last one again. But I do have space. The problem is that there is enough room to, to move back a bit. So I'm going to do a recapture. This is uh, somewhat stressing. 
Well, I think that everybody is awake. I hope that everybody is still awake. Well, we have done a partial recapture. Yes, we have done partial recapture, and let's see whether anything has changed. This is shown differently in the ultrasound. You can see the echo here. No, but that's a different angle. No, the angle doesn't change, I swear you. No, it's too deep. Show us the ridge. No, I promise. Probably I am pushing the ridge, the ridge. but give me some contrast. Well, the real question is about this uh, space. This could be a nest for a thrombus. Yes. No, but I think this is part of how the watchman adapts and fits. Let's inject a bit of contrast. It seems that we can't cover any more because I think that this is the limit. If it's more proximal, I don't think. Well, yes, of course, Miguel, this is a bi-dimensional view. If you are able to rotate, probably what you see with fluoroscopy is different from what you see in ultrasound. So let's do the tuck test. Initially, it's OK. So I think that you have release criteria. You have good compression. The tuck test is perfect. There are no leaks. The question is what to do with this lobe. And if you think it's OK, we accept your decision. But definitely, there is one area which is not covered. Fermin, I have recaptured and deployed again. We have to reassess. Ah, you recaptured. Yes, of course. Ah, you didn't mention that. Let's go back. Yes, probably I was not paying attention. So you recaptured. I recaptured. So you paid attention to our advice. Yes, yes, whatever Fermin says, I follow him. Well, let us have another injection in the new position. No, we now like it better. It's covering a bit more. You can see it on the eyes, yes. And it's more proximal than in the beginning. Let me inject some contrast. I think these sacs, the second sac, will fill up later. The large sac of the appendage fills up later. But it is filling up from inside, not from outside. So probably it's covered because the mesh is inside the sacs. Yes, let's see the caudal AP view. Let's reassess with an AP caudal view. I can't go any more proximal. Yes, now you have a better position. I'm going to inject a bit more over here. Well, I admit that I am using a lot of contrast. No. But you just have a tiny little bit, which is impossible to correct. Everything is covered. The large are covered, and particularly the posterior lobe. Can you stop the image? And let's see frame by frame until we reach to the end. Stop the image and go frame by frame. No, no. Stop the image. Stop. You recorded that, no? Are you recording? No, it's distorted. We don't understand what you are saying. You recorded the last image? Did you record the last image? Ah, that's much better. You were shouting before. <laughs> OK, could you stop it and put it frame by frame until the end to see it clearly? OK, this is the first one. I would say that the device is right here. I am going to look at various angles with the intracardiac echo.
Well, there is no flow, as you can see. You can record those images, please. And I am... No, stop there, stop. Well, what you have here is minimal, smaller than the previous one, yes. You can clearly see it here. This is the device and you barely have a, a millimeter, maybe two millimeters, no more, but that's all you can do, no. If I move more proximal, I will lose it. So the fact that we chose a large watchman, if we had chosen a smaller one, we would have more coverage problems. Which one did you choose? 27, 27 was my choice. And I had measured 17 initially, so I was very aggressive with sizing, but when you have enough depth, I think it's worthwhile. Well, yes, I believe that's uh, the idea. Whatever the chart says, you have to go one size above. Well, the chart had told us 24, or 21, 21. Yeah, and I decided for 27. Well, I think that's it. The compression is at 18, the CT is perfect and there was no flow, let me move back a bit. I'm going to release, releasing now. One turn, two turns, three turns, released. I'm going to inject contrast from here. One final contrast injection and this is the result. Give me the right oblique. Well, it is uh, pretty well seated. I couldn't go any more proximal. The lower shoulder looks a bit different. Yes, it always takes a different angle after releasing. So let's take a look with eyes. It's okay here. And this is the small lobule which was left uncovered, but there is nothing I can do about that. No, I think it's excellent, Miguel. We are ready to move on to the next room. Do we have any final comments? Congratulations. This was an excellent case. Well, thank you. So let's... Uh, do a figure of eight suture and the right outflow tract. Yes, in the end you go to the uh, outflow tract to prove that there is no pericardic effusion. This is the watchman. Well, you can see the image, it's pretty clear and it's pretty well seated. It's very good, very well. Okay, so bye-bye and thank you. Regalen la sutura, porfis. Sin break, a la otra sala. Right. Ah? Ay, con tel, uy. Hey, Fermi. In full of the standard. I don't have to do this. I mean, in this case, the open is smaller here. Okay, Luis. Creo que, creo que nos llevan una morena por delante, ¿no? Como no se dice en Venezuela, ya, ya pusieron el device. Luis. Yeah, uh, hola, Fermín. Cuéntanos, aquí, ¿dónde estamos? Where are we? Tell us. Uh, can you guys fix his microphone because we cannot hear? Le pueden arreglar el micrófono al doctor Andrea Natale. El micrófono lo tiene tal vez muy bajito. No se oye la voz del doctor Natale. Nos puede decir qué pasó desde el comienzo. Ya vemos que han implantado el dispositivo, pero queremos ver desde un comienzo. Sí, sí, oímos. 
toca que hable un poquito más fuerte. Métame en el ice. ¿Dónde está la entrada? ¿Está bien ahora? No. Sí, creo que sí. ¿Puedes mover el micrófono en frente? So what I was saying is that uh, this device, uh, it's, a, it's easier to deploy than uh, the watchman. The, with the watchman, you have to go to the tip of the appendix. So, no. so you have to be a, a, certainly a mo much more careful when you, are, when you deploy. And in general, with the watchman, we do the deployment uh, uh, without uh, the patient breathing. With this device, you don't have to be at the tip of the appendix halfway. So uh, it's certainly easier. And... Uh, um, uh, Uh, with the size in uh, my experience with the size in uh, uh, is that you, you, we tend to be a little more precise uh, with the watchman clearly you need a 20-30% compression with this one if you go to the sort of the, uh, the standard 3-5 uh, uh, to five, especially if you go uh, closer to the 5 millimeter from the measurement if you take with the, angi the angiography the, the distal portion usually is, n is never open up nicely so we, we tend to be closer So I, I usually like to do three millimeter above uh, of four. In this case, we did four, I think. Did you, did you uh, guys save any echo pictures before you deploy it? We took uh, some uh, angiography and echo picture, yes. Okay. Angiography. Because we only have the, the actual image right now with the device implanted. We would like to see some of the pre-implantation echo images. Okay, let, can we show the, the, the audience uh, is asking me. Uh, uh, Gabriel, están pidiendo el auditorio si puede mostrar las, las imágenes preimplante de ECO. Sí. Espérate por si preguntan de la punción. Busca la punción que está ahí. Sí, me acaban de preguntar la punción también. Sí. Uh, So the, the, the things with this appendage, you, you appreciate that more with the androgram, is the distal part is much smaller than the proximal. So if we take the bigger device, which was a 25, probably the distal portion was not going to be, uh, be able to deploy properly. So we choose a 22 for that reason. I think you appreciate that more in the angiogram than in the, in the So echo. in this echo view, you would make the same measurement, correct? From the yes, circumflex yes, to the, the tip? Yes, pretty much the about 18, right? Do, do you have an image when you guys made the measurement so we can show it? Uh, can you show how we made, it, we made the, me the measurement on... Uh, why don't you take the measurement on that? Can you do that? Yes. Yes. No, esa es la imagen de ECO, pero nos puedes enseñar cuando hicieron las mediciones, Luis. ¿Las mediciones de ECO, dices tú? Sí, por supuesto. ¿eh? Ahí. Ahí están. Entonces, yes. que Andrea explique por qué hace dos mediciones aquí, en vez de una sola, por favor, en vez del Watchman, tenemos una sola medición. Aquí hay dos. Two measurements instead of just one. Because the kind of device is well, we are, yeah, because we have the distal portion, which is called the, uh, the which is the landed zone, and then the proximal is the one I actually occlude the more proximal portion. So that's why we have those two measurements. So the the, the, the one more inside is the landing zone. Maybe we can show the X-ray to, to try to explain the. So kind this of is the landing zone, and this is the size of the device, the proximal, yes. correct? Yes. Yes. So what was the measurement for the size of the device you're going to choose? So So we, uh, we measure about 18 and we choose a 22. Carlos. So for, in, in, sometimes people like to go to, if you look at the, follow the standard criteria, they probably would advise a 25. But a 25 uh, um, would have been problematic because it would have been, the distal portion would have been too big for the size of the, of this appendage. And, and in, in my experience is that it's been always the same with the amulet. We always tend to go closer to uh, the measured dimension. So we always tend to, to choose a smaller device because otherwise if you go to the bigger one uh, based on the three to five millimeter, we always tend to have to uh, then go back to the smaller one. Uh, mostly because of the distal portion doesn't deploy properly. It gets squeezed too much. Okay. Then once we deploy the, pro the distal portion, then we advance the proximal. And if we think you're in a good position, then we, you see by Floro, I'm going to show you, we leave this, uh, okay, you, you leave this uh, like in, in this uh, sort of persistent tagging situation, so to make sure the device is stable. And we leave that, 
for a couple of minutes. We've been much longer now. The device is very, very stable. So, okay. So we, Hermin, come in. Did you go to the other room? I'm, I'm here. Hermine? Okay, we lost you. No, I, I know. You don't have to hold him. Well, we are all paying attention. So, uh, deploy. So, it's just a screw. This is too close to the things. But is this pre deployment? Yes. What are you guys doing now? We just uh, uh, waiting for you guys. If uh, we, we took the measure and it looks okay, we're ready to disconnect the device. Well, but you already placed the device in the appendage, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Have you done you any the, any venograms that we can see? You should be able to see the floor there. Yes, we can see it. Uh, do you yeah. do venograms? Like, uh, not venograms, but an angiogram from the chief before you deploy it? No, we really don't have to do it. We just want to know the differences in the procedure between implanting a watchman and implanting an amulet. So in, in, in the amulet, so you will not do an angiogram, correct? Yeah, the, well, the angiogram is more important with the watchman, and also the, the sheet has to be at the tip of the watchman. Whereas with this one, it doesn't have to be at the tip. As long as you are halfway through, it's, it's good enough. And I think that's kind of important because potentially can reduce uh, the yeah. complication. Because with the, the tip, uh, the, the, the delivery sheet at the tip of the appendix, you really have to be extremely careful in what, the way you pull the device. So you have to actually hold the device and pull back the sheet with the watchman. And uh, if you uh, are not very careful and you just push the device a little bit in, that can be enough to cause a perforation because the, the sheet is really at the tip of the appendix of the watch, which is, which is not required with the amulet. Uh, okay, we, we got that, Andrea, but independently from that, what, what is your criteria here in terms of occlusion? We can beautifully see the circle in T. Yeah. Is there any, any flow through the reach of the device on the top or the bottom? Uh, how do you yeah, assess we, that we, before you release yeah, it? Be, yeah, we want to be uh, proximal. So ideally, you want to see the proximal part sticking completely out. The problem is that uh, uh, to do that, we have to go to the bigger device. And with the bigger device, uh, we think that the, the distal portion is going to be too big. So this is the best compromise. But we're kind of close to the optimal deployment. The optimal deployment is with the proximal portion really sticking out of uh, uh, the Coumadin Ridge. Here you are just at the level of the Coumadin Ridge. Okay. OK, we got that. For example, we can see the differences of the quality of the image for echocardiography with intracardiac echo versus this. The other limitation in the fluoro la otra limitación en la fluoroscopia es que aquí está la prueba del TI en el medio con eco intracardíaco, veíamos mucho mejor la fluoroscopia y creo que las imágenes, no hay duda que son mejores con eco intracardíaco dentro de la aurícula izquierda, ¿no? I, I, I like when it's possible to have intracardiac echo because uh, uh, help me with the transeptal. The, the transeptal puncture is a key uh, part of the procedure to have an easy deployment. So for example, in this case, uh, we went uh, low enough that we could engage the appendage without using a pit tape. Uh, otherwise, if you go too high, you need to have a, you're going to have to use a pit tape. So it just uh, makes the entire procedure much easier uh, with uh, uh, the proper transeptal access. The best trans transeptal access is low posterior, or, or, however, in some of the cases uh, uh, that we've done, and, and you can appreciate this much better with the eyes. If the appendage is more anterior, then we tend to go posterior, very, very low, but slightly anterior. So we are in the same plane of the appendage. So we use the eyes to, to, to try to puncture as low as we can and uh, in the plane of the appendage as much as possible. And you, did you save any images for that that you can show us? We are looking for uh, that, Fermin. We, I don't know if we save it. I don't know if we save it. But uh, with T, you're not going to get those features. You don't. And whereas with ice, you do. And that's the advantage of the ice. So I use the ice. Uh, I like the ice for the concept of ice. Yeah, I just want to yeah. clarify something for the audience. La otra yes. cosa que pasa es que no puedes usar las dos imágenes de eco simultáneamente. Porque si tienes el prop de ti y pones el prop sí. de ice, hay un artefacto gigantesco artefacto, en el sí, prop sí. de ice. O tienes que apagar completamente el ice 
o apagar completamente el ti porque no, no, no hay una interacción entre los dos props y no ves nada absolutamente. Por eso lo que él está diciendo es que utilizaron ICE para la transeptal para definir el mejor sitio de punción de transeptal. Una vez que hicieron la transeptal, sacaron el ICE y utilizaron el TI para, uh, para deploy el device, que fue completamente diferente a lo que hicimos en el, en el procedimiento anterior, en el cual el ICE estaba dentro de la aurícula izquierda y no utilizamos TI. Pero no puedes hacer imágenes de eco con los dos al mismo tiempo porque el artefacto es horrible y no se ve nada. Tenemos las imágenes de la perforación transeptal de, de la punción transeptal. Andrea is, the, Andrea is uh, delivering the, uh, so the acaban device. Acaban de, de liberar el device. Exactamente. You want to do? Get the garage right now. Get the garage on Yes. Van a hacer una angiografía al final o tampoco hay angiografía? Sí. Look at the end. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we are. Can you look for the images of the transeptal puncture, please? We found them, and the puncture is critical. It's critical. ¿Nos explican lo que están yes. viendo ahí, Andrea? Explain the, the image. The, really, the T is, is the best way to kind of look at the, I mean, there is no leak that we can, you can see there with the angle. It's pretty really good. The device looks stable, so. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, ¿Puedes mostrar algo más, Gabriel? Gabriel. As you can see, there is no mix. Uh, in the tree EE, and uh, the device uh, appears stable. It was stable for more than one, one than half an hour while we were waiting to connect, uh, and the stability tests were done. Now, what we can show at this point uh, is the transeptual puncture, which I think is critical. Can we connect with the eyes, please? Intracardiac uh, uh, echo, please. Ice. It's a completely different technology. Very different with, from what we saw with the watchman. We are trying to connect to the ice. The, the reach of the appendage is in relationship to the closure device because I think that's the key for for, for why this device could be a different technology than what's Uh, that's the image you were wanting to see, Fermin. Yes, we can see the ridge a bit better. Yes, this is the ridge. It's a bit dark. Maybe it is the view. But we see how the, it covers more towards the upper part of the ridge. 
la parte superior en este caso está sobresaliendo un poco porque yo les decía que para llegar a ese punto tenemos que utilizar un dispositivo más grande, pero pensamos que no íbamos a poder a desplegar correctamente la parte distal. La parte distal de esta auriculilla es muy pequeña, entonces parece que está dentro del reach, pero el despliegue es bueno, está proximal, está muy bien. Se ve muy bien. Nos muestra la transeptal. Y yes, they're trying to connect it. Hicimos una buena, una muy buena grabación, pero estamos buscando. They are exchanging the, the connection cable from the TEE to the ICE. Any other questions about uh, anticoagulation protocols? For example, the patient. Después de Apixaban pasamos directamente. Esa es la ventaja que nos da la Amulet, que uno puede ir directamente a hacer la terapia versus hacer los 45 días sin. Se puede dejar en 2.5 durante un par de meses. Uh -huh. And ACTs of 350 were maintained. Can we have the entire image of the ice? Se ve la transeptal? Sí. Y habíamos podido ir más abajo, pero si bajaba más iba a quedar muy posterior. Entonces, esto fue lo que mejor que logramos. Y nos fuimos directo a la auriculilla con la camisa del amulet, para el amulet. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Sí, doctor Natale, puede seguir explicando. Y luego vemos the dilator. You can see the, you can see the, the plane of the appendage in, in the field. It's not super clear because we didn't spend time to save it. Esta. But, yeah, but you, este mejor. Yeah. This is where we, we, we punch her. So uh, the key is as low as possible, and then if you can choose the plane uh, post more posterior or slightly anterior based on where you see the appendage. Okay. Exacto, porque, eh, but, decir, but, the, but it's very important that you go as low as you can. Exacto, That's a really important. Tradicionalmente se dice que debemos ir posteri eh, inferiores y posteriores, sí, pero la clave es ir inferior. Cases, yes. Yes. La clave es ir, ir inferior y escoger si vas anterior o posterior Slide para in. alinearte de acuerdo sí, a lo que veas en el apéndice. Aquí, aquí hay una, 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 una cosa clave de la punción, es que si se ve el apéndice se veía en esta imagen sí. del eco bien abajo. Yes. You could see it in this echo image very low, it was very low. That's why the puncture needs to be very low and it was aligned in the same section in which uh, the appendage was being seen on the ice. That is why many operators prefer to use ice because we better understand. We are more used uh, to guiding the puncture under ice and the rest is done under TEE. I think that the difference, Luis, is that we are used to this in my hospital. Interventional cardiologists do, that do this prefer to do it under TEE from the very beginning. So it really depends on the practice. Yeah, I agree, I agree. But uh, the other key point is that when the, you, when the punctures are very low, and in particular, if the orientation of the appendage suggests that we need to do a low and posterior puncture, the key is to do it with cautery, cautery because the needle is uh, coming relatively close to the tissue. You can't see it very well here, but let us, let us see the first one, the first one. If you realize here, look at this. Uh, these were very, several 
attempts we made, but it was too low, too low. So the issue is once you select the right site, uh, yeah, that's very important because this very low puncture may go into the right, into the left atrium and uh, perforate the epicardium, and you don't realize that until you remove the sheath and then you find a pericardial puncture because the, the sheath was uh, occluding the hole, but you go through and through. You end up in the left atrium, but with an epicardial tract, and that is very important because uh, epicardic effusion is late, and after that there will be... Um, hypertension yes and that allows to clarify a very important thing when we use eyes guided procedures be the be there punctures or ablations and it is that you need to watch and don't uh, uh, um, stop seeing the tip in this case of the needle because the shaft doesn't tell you anything the shaft is there close but you don't know where the needle is whether it is more anterior or posterior this puncture that was going to be done very low was because we lost sight of the tip of the needle and obviously we never advanced until we are totally sure of where the tip of the needle is in the eyes so we corrected the puncture but very low punctures and somewhat posterior punctures if you just push the needle using pressure just using pressure it very probably you may lacerate or puncture the posterior wall and cause bleeding, etc. So in those cases, in this type of puncture, it is better to do it under or using cautery. We use uh, 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 30 watt uh, cutting mode, no co coagulation, just a brief brief touch of the cautery, and it is a puncture done more with a cutting mode than with pressure, as I say, and that prevents accidents. Uh, once you pass the needle, you orient it anteriorly somewhat and you advance the dilator and the rest. So those were the important aspects. Uh, and again, we want to close by saying that as you realize, uh, a very, very important step in this type of procedure is the adequate puncture, what you need for the patient. And uh, all these imaging methods and eyes help us a lot. Okay, Luis, thank you very much. We're going to have a break here and we wait to see you here and congratulations to you. It is also a very good case. Okay, great. <laughs> Well, before you leave, here you can see how useful the echo is with one single image and the importance of paying attention, particularly uh, now when we have so many publications of symptomatic embolism. This is a patient in whom we are doing a second transeptal puncture, heparinized uh, ACT320 INR 2.3. And this is what I wanted to tell you. Before pushing the sheath, here you can see the tenting needle. I always pay attention to this area before pushing. And here you can see that there is a small, and, and that's why echo is so important. Echo is not just to tell you where to puncture or, went or where to push. But before pushing the sheath in the left atrium, I must see and focus prior to pushing. And clearly, this is a clot. If you push this, the clot probably ends up in the left atrium or trapped along the pathway of the transeptal. So what do we do? I do negative suction, and this is the clot. This clot, maybe it's not too large, less than one centimeter, but this embolizes to the brain, and you know what will happen. And this has been proven just because we pay attention to the sheath before we cross. And that's why I asked Miguel to slow down and look at it carefully, pay attention, and use the echo not just to know where to puncture and how to orient yourself, but to prevent complications. I think one image is better than 1,000 words, and that's why I wanted to show it to you before taking our